In this next example, I'd like to look at another nonlinear model, uh, the Farquhar von Kammer Berry model, which is a very common model to, to model uh, photosynthetic rates, and use it as an example of how we can add hierarchical covariates into a nonlinear process model. Uh, so, to quickly introduce you to this model, it, it has uh, a couple parts. So, first saying that uh, the overall modeled photosynthetic rate is the minimum of two alternative rates. One, uh, AV, which is uh, you know, uh, limited by the uh, rate of carboxylation, so basically rate it limited by uh, CO2. And the other one, AJ, which is essentially uh, the light limited state of the photosynthetic rel relationship. So we have, uh, you know, you're choosing between a nonlinear model for a CO2 limitation and a nonlinear model for a light limitation. Uh, and then you have this uh, respiration rate. And so you could imagine uh, here would be an example of uh, what's predicted by each of those two terms and how the actual observations uh, do actually quite match well uh, that minimum. But now we have the challenge of, of fitting kind of two nonlinear models simultaneously with a, a change point between the two of them. Uh, the data for fitting these models is often generated uh, by running what's called a response curve, where you might hold everything constant except light and then vary the light level and see how the photosynthetic response changes. And then you might run a CO2 response curve where you hold everything uh, constant, set light at a high uh, saturating level and, and vary CO2 concentration and see how that causes uh, photosynthesis to vary. There's a number of parameters in this model, such as you know, this VC max, which is con controlling the maximum rate of photosynth photosynthesis, uh, this J, which considers controls the rate of uh, light limitation, which itself in includes parameters for a, a J max, a saturation, alpha, a slope under the uh, low light conditions, and this Q parameter that controls the curvature between the two. Uh, and then there's this uh, gamma parameter, uh, which is a, a compensation point, and then these, these half saturation parameters uh, in the um, for here's the half saturation for CO2, and then there's this effect of, of oxygen on the, the CO2 rate, basically that oxygen can compete with CO2 uh, within the biochemistry of, of uh, photosynthesis. So a pretty complicated model uh, with a good number of parameters. Um, so that model could be fit, uh, it could be fit uh, you know, uh, in the Bayesian or uh, frequentist perspective. I'm going to focus on, in, in this particular analysis, we're going to focus uh, on the Bayesian parameterization of this model. And if you just had one set of response curves, you could fit that uh, to this data uh, quite well. It usually fits quite cleanly. Um, but what if you have data from multiple species and multiple individuals over time? And now you have uh, different possible uh, sources of variability. So we have uh, both uh, variability among individuals that, you know, if I measure one leaf on a plant and uh, a leaf on a, a another plant of the same species, uh, that they're not going to give me the exact same parameters. There's going to be this uh, leaf to leaf variability, uh, but there's also going to be this species to species variability. That the parameters, the, the best fitting parameters in this model will change uh, from species to species. So in this particular case, we accommodated that uh, in a number of ways. So um, one way we did that uh, was we primarily looked at, uh, chose two parameters to make higher, well, we, we made this VC max parameter, the maximum rate uh, of photosynthesis under the CO2 limited case um, to be uh, to have hierarchical variability, and we made this other parameter alpha, uh, which describes the the light limitation, the uh, rate of photosynthesis when you are light limited, so the low light condition. Uh, made that um, hierarchical as well, and so within that hierarchical parameter, we do have uh, a random leaf effect in both of these 
parameters, so there's a random effect on both. Uh, but then we also added uh, a number of fixed effects. So we had a model that accounted, basically we put a, a, a mixed effects model on these two parameters within a nonlinear model. So for VC max, we had its overall mean parameter. We had a, a response of, of VC max to leaf nitrogen. This, this N minus N bar reflects that we were centering that. So, uh, we're, you know, so this could be the overall mean and, and we're measuring the nitrogen relative to that. So we have a slope uh, for that. And then we have this month effect to capture um, seasonal variability in photosynthesis. It's not effect, uh, explained by the nitrogen effect. Now that seasonal variability could arguably be, be modeled as a, as a random effect as well. But in this case, we chose it to be a fixed effect under the argument uh, that if we actually repeated this uh, analysis, again, we actually would expect, uh, you know, the, the measurements in, in the different parts of the seasonal cycle to be consistent, uh, you know, from, from year to year. We had multiple years of data to estimate those, those month effects. Uh, on the um, rate of photosynthesis under light limiting conditions, we have an overall mean, we have an, a, a slope related to uh, the chlorophyll concentration of the leaf, uh, which makes sense because chlorophyll is related to uh, light harvesting. And then we have this uh, parameter, this uh, slope on a parameter called SLA, the specific leaf area, which essentially is uh, telling us about the thickness of the leaves. And then we have this, uh, again, this random effect for individual leaf. So here is showing uh, the performance of this model under both uh, in terms of predicted photosynthesis versus observed photosynthesis. This is when we fit uh, uh, the model to all the data at once and versus here when we fit the model allowing for these hierarchical fixed and random effects um, showing that our predicted, that we, uh, when we fit everything to at once uh, and don't include those fixed and random effects on the parameters, we, we don't get a good fit. We have a, a, a maximum that is, you know, well below, the predicted maximum that's well below what's actually observed and a whole lot of scatter. While you would, could argue that the this predicted versus observed, uh, once we've accounted for those hierarchical fixed and random effects, uh, is doing quite well at capturing the, the actual variability that we see from leaf to leaf. So again, we're, we're capturing leaf to leaf variability uh, using a combination of, of fixed effects on how leaf traits are affecting the parameters in this model and random effects on how uh, the parameters in this model are varying from leaf to leaf. Uh, this graph shows a bit about how, what those responses look like and the different scales of variability we were able to capture. Uh, so here we're actually, say, looking at how VCMAX is changing as a function of leaf nitrogen. Uh, and here is uh, the mean and the slope for each of those individual uh, species by species fits, showing that we actually have uh, actually a fairly consistent within species response uh, to leaf nitrogen. And by contrast, these are how different species respond to leaf nitrogen. We have a very different across species response uh, to leaf nitrogen than we do the within species response. And that was actually an important finding because uh, I think prior to this, a lot of folks that were modeling how uh, leaf uh, leaves responded, leaf parameters responded to, to leaf nitrogen were using an, an across species relationship uh, to describe uh, within species variability. And we can see like if we're looking at this four group, this, the cross species uh, slope would be very different than the within species slope. And even this overall across species across C3 was, was different than what we see within the individual species. 